Hello and welcome to this, our very first uh, expert corner uh, on reframing human error and uh, looking for team success. And my name is Catherine Kay, I'm part of the NSF team and I'm delighted to be joined today by Julie, Julie Avery. Thanks for joining us and giving up your time today, Julie. So um, just Hi. a very brief introductions then. Um, my name is Catherine. I've been part of the NSF team now for four years, but I um, have worked in industry for a number of years and specifically um, in manufacturing roles within the pharmaceutical industry. And certainly this topic on looking at human performance and how we can set our teams up for success has been a real passion of mine. Uh, and so I'm delighted that I've also got the opportunity to sort of discuss some of these questions with Julie. So, so Julie is one of our independent consultants at NSF. Uh, human factors specialist, um, delivers training and consulting for us. And Julie's also uh, a trustee member of the Chartered Institute of Ergonomics and Human Factors. So welcome to you, Julie, and, and thank you so much for, for your time you. today. So before I get started with a few questions for you, Julie, I just thought I'd set the scene a little bit um, for, for everybody that's sure. joined us today. Um, and to help us do that, I thought it would be good to maybe draw upon um, what's stated in the GMP, so the Good Manufacturing Practices Guidances Regulations, um, uh, that are stated within Nudrilex Volume 4, Part 1, and I've specifically put it up here on the slide. Chapter 1 is around the pharmaceutical quality system. Uh, and you know, this isn't a new requirement. This has been around for a number of years now, and it has been a regulatory focus and probably an overall dissatisfaction really with the regulators in that human error is very often being named as the root cause to deviation. So people aren't going beyond that. They're just listing human error as the root cause for deviation. And certainly at NSF, we've been seeing this. Um, you know, we've worked with, with numbers of clients that have struggled a little bit really to look beyond the surface, look you know, beyond that human error and really truly understand you know, the challenges and the issues. And therefore all of those underlying causes. Um, and so this quote uh, is taken directly from the guidance and it really says that an appropriate level of root cause analysis should be applied during uh, the investigation of deviations. And then it goes on to say, you know, where human error is suspected or identified as the cause, then this should be justified having taken care to ensure that you've looked at your process, you've looked at your procedures, those system-based errors. So you need to ensure that those those areas haven't been overlooked if they're present and really getting people to look you know, beyond that human error. So it's something that is not new. It's been out there for a long while, but it's still a common area where people have, have challenges. Um, yes. And ultimately, you know, we're, we're doing all of this, aren't we? Uh, whether we're making medicines, medical devices, any healthcare products, really, um, you know, we need to make sure that we're ensuring patient safety, ultimately, number one, patient safety. And of course, that there is therefore overall patient benefit. Um, and so I just wanted to mention, you know, NSF's mission statement, which has been the same for the last 75 years, is all around protecting and improving human health. So without further ado, because I am keen to, to um, get us discussing this topic a little bit more, um, kind of the first question that I wanted to share with you, oh, and also just to, man, uh, to, to let all of those that are listening uh, today uh, to us, there is an opportunity to ask questions as well. So do put into those like a Q&A panel uh, within the platform. If you've got any questions, then pop that into the Q&A panel. Uh, and if we don't have time to touch on them at the end of this 30 minute session, we will respond to each one of you individually and, and get back to you with an answer. So please, as we're chatting, if something comes into mind, pop that into the Q&A panel uh, within the platform and uh, we will get back to you. So the first question uh, that I have for you then, Julie, is that, you know, how would you summarize your approach to reframing human error? Because that's what we're looking at today in team success. So how would you summarize your approach to reframing human error and the differences that you've seen in industry? Because I know you've spent many years uh, in industry and, and, and specifically in this field. Thanks for that question, Catherine. So reframing really means that we think again, we take a different view about how we think about human error. And that's very much the difference of my approach that I've learned over the years, a lot from other industries. So my understanding, the way I approach things now is very much based on what I've learned uh, from others who very generously shared their experiences. 
key thing for people, um, we tend to focus on their error. And so we want to think about um, people as problem solvers rather than the problem to solve. And when we do that, then we're in a completely different place when we're looking at um, deviation investigations or trying to do continuous improvement. As leaders, we work on the system and managers, operators, technicians, engineers work in the system. And I think a key way that we think differently about our approach for human factors is its system thinking. Sometimes what we find is we become very problem centric. And of course, it's very important to fix the problems that happen and go wrong. But if we don't look at it systematically, then we're more likely to be revisiting repeat deviations or maybe having a solution or a corrective preventive action that doesn't really work very well. So although it seems a trite phrase to say, let's set people up for success. If you have that approach strategically and tactically, then you will make a big difference because it's a bit like a course correction at the mm -hmm. beginning of a journey. And if I slightly alter my course, then I take a different road and a different path and hopefully with much better results. Sometimes we think about why we need to do these things. And um, sometimes we think about it when it's gone wrong. And when something's gone wrong, especially something significant, this can be quite a difficult and challenging time for the company. So one key way we can think differently and approach human factors uh, differently is to do it proactively because we can start to predict and there hopefully prevent the opportunities for error as we go on. And when we're in that space, our thinking is more open, uh, perhaps we have a little bit more time, and it can be a collaborative experience. So that approach can actually make it almost enjoyable, may I say, if we're actually proactively trying to make the work easier and helping people improve their own work. Um, I have been <laughs> guilty of uh, polling up to an area, a manufacturing area maybe, and thinking, genuinely trying to help people, that I've got this great idea and we're going to make everything so wonderful and so much better. What I haven't been so good at in the past is enabling people to improve their own work. And that's very much a focus for my approach right now. One uh, thought I had uh, for this conversation was to just summarize the question by saying, what might we see? What might we hear? And how might people feel differently when we use human factors um, in, a pro in a proactive way? So I've just got a couple of notes here. So if we're thinking about setting people up for success and people are problem solvers and not the problem to solve, what we might see is continuous improvement in quality systems or safety or efficiency um, baked into people's working week. So often when you ask people how much time is allocated to them to improve their work, sadly, um, it's almost nothing. Um, we would see lead measures. So uh, lag measures are results. So my weight is a lag measure and how much I eat, uh, how much exercise I take, that's a lead measure. So if I can see more uh, realistic and meaningful lead measures, then we can understand how we're making improvements as we go. And we don't just measure success in the absence of failure. We are a little bit prone, shall we say, in the quality industry uh, to measure uh, success by the absence of failure. So if I have fewer deviations, um, I'm happy about that. Of course, I don't want lots of deviations because they mean work. Um, on the flip side, a deviation means it's an opportunity to improve. So it's just finding the measures that really help us understand whether we're assuring quality going in. It's a verb um, rather than just coming to the end of the month and saying, oh, that wasn't a very good month for quality because we had lots of deviations. And what will we hear if we take this new different approach? Well, We'll actually hear the voices of those who do the work. We'll hear them uh, being able to share their opinions and ideas and being heard. Um, from leaders, I think we'll hear fewer closed questions. Sometimes it's very tempting, perhaps for speed, uh, to ask closed questions. So I'll ask, is everything OK on the line today? I mean well, but when the person answers yes or no, I haven't really learned very much. So I would expect to hear more open questions, something like, talk me through what you're doing. Or if something has gone wrong, rather than say what happened, 
say, what was the situation? Uh, what adaptations did you have to make? Did you know what to do? This is a much more open learning way of finding out um, how people are having to adapt every day and what their challenges are. And then finally, what would we uh, feel or what would people feel if we take this approach? I think from my experience that people feel involved, uh, they feel genuinely included and they feel valued. And um, this opportunity to really demonstrate respect for the patient in this way um, is a great opportunity. Oh, thanks, Julie. I really like the structure, the way that you answered that in, you know, those takeaways really on what people will, you know, what will they see? So the approach with what they will see and what will they hear and what they'll feel. So, so no, thank you for that. And uh, kind of just helps embed some of those points. So if I was to move on then, um, you know, what questions do you find people often ask you when, when starting or continuing their human performance journey? What are the types of questions do you do you find that they're asking? Yes. So it depends on their situation um, when, when they come. And it also depends on their role in the company. But these are the kind of things that I've most commonly experienced and indeed <laughs> have asked myself from time to time. Um, first of all, it's about what to measure. How can I demonstrate that I've made a difference by taking this approach? What would I um, choose to um, um, measure and improve. Um, partly that's in order to get the time and the resource um, for the for the work. Um, cracking open time for people to make improvements and doing some proactive work can be really challenging for companies. I really understand that. Um, if, if it's because something has gone uh, wrong or significantly wrong perhaps, then usually time is not a problem because clearly the uh, situation is serious and we absolutely have to be confident for patient safety before we move on. So that's that's one of the areas that are questions that I get asked. Um, people uh, sometimes just don't know where to start. I think this is one of the things I still find myself with human factors. It can feel a little bit overwhelming when we're looking at underlying factors. We call this um, either latent failures or the second story. Um, this can be like a massive subject for us uh, to look at and people feel like they have to put so many things right in order to um, prevent human error going forward and I think using some tools and techniques that we talk about in our training and approaches um, really helps us focus in on an area that has some boundaries so that we can understand the discrete part of the work that we're doing but if we're looking at a particular task, say, that's gone wrong, we don't just look at it in isolation. It's really understanding the influencing factors. And I have found in my experience, this is missing from bulk standard root cause analysis training sometimes, um, is that we haven't really understood what influences people um, and the decisions and actions that they're making. Um, there's the opportunity to think about explicit knowledge which is what's written down in the SOP or policies or procedures, for instance. And then we have the tacit knowledge, which is what is in people's minds, hearts and experiences that bring these things together. Um, if we try to write an SOP, let's say, for making a cup of tea that included absolutely every single step and every potential thing that could go wrong, it probably would be hundreds of pages long. But we all know that we have basic instructions for making a cup of tea into which we add ourselves, the best of ourselves, in terms of knowledge and understanding. Um, so how, um, one question I have, another question that I get is, well, we've got operational excellence, we've got lean manufacturing, what do we need human performance for? Um, and that's, that's a great opportunity is to learn from the company what benefits they're getting, what their focus is on operational excellence, and really understanding with the human performance thinking, how we can integrate with operational excellence. So just one example is 5S, which is how you arrange your workplace and the information you have in your material. It's a huge support for people to do their work uh, correctly. But sometimes we are focusing so much on removing waste from a process, it can become quite brittle. And although we're set up for success, so we're assuming everything is right, I will have the right materials, I will have the right people, I will have the right um, information that I need immediately to hand. If I don't have that, then sometimes people are then left 
to try and make decisions in a less than perfect environment and the process breaks. So this is my personal experience. So we need to be able to standardize with lean and remove waste where it's possible, but where we need people to be able to have their uh, knowledge and experience brought to the table and brought to the workplace in the moment, then there's a allowed uh, for variation in, in what we do without having any um, influence negatively on process resilience. Um, and the final question that often are, I get asked is how we link this into quality systems. So the most common way would be in through deviation management, root cause analysis, uh, analysis and kappa selection. Um, this is a great way in because we've got the um, remedial and re uh, reactive issues in terms of deviation management. But then, of course, with the preventive action, we've got the opportunity uh, to improve going forward. So that's probably the most common way we um, think about starting. So if I might just summarize like I did before, if we um, think about this journey and the places to start, what we would see is, again, people being involved and how we can drive that learning for change. Because every time we learn something more about our process because something's gone wrong or we have an objective to achieve, we need to drive change in through the business. Of course, we have a change control for compliance, but we also need to understand the human aspect of that. Um, we should be able to hear more coaching from leaders in this way of thinking, because I'm really trying to learn from you, my team, um, and then helping people come to their own conclusions. And people feel that they're really being listened to. So again, not just solving a problem over on the side and someone giving you the answer without ever discussing it with you. And this makes, um, I think it really adds to the enjoyment that people have of the workplace that I found. I know it sounds a bit crazy, but people actually say, oh, this has actually been quite fun. And that's because we've really taken that holistic approach and given people time to, and the headspace, to bring the best of themselves to the workplace. No, thank you, Julie. That makes a lot of sense. And and I really like that point that you made at the end, um, which is that leaders really need to make sure they find time to spend time coaching others and as you say having that time to to, to listen as well listen and understand so no thank you for that yes. um that's just sorry so just to explain sorry yeah just to explain Go the ahead. picture um i often talk about um the clock and the compass so it's it's um of course we live in a busy world and we always have these competing objectives of the clock time i've got to do it quickly against the compass about doing it in in a correct way so that talking about it in the clock and the compass can sort of help people to understand that there are times, and I know we all know this as quality professionals or safety professionals, that there are times when we absolutely need to stay with the compass, um, challenging as it is <laughs> for deadlines. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, no, thank you. So, um, no, thanks for that. And so moving on, actually, this this kind of next picture kind of draws on, on the next question that I kind of have for you, which yes. is around um, and, and sort of prompting probably some of the, the responses, which is around, you know, what have we learned then from other se sectors on this topic? Because, you know, this 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 topic covers all, all sectors. I mean, yes, maybe today we're looking and just because of our background, sort of more kind of the healthcare and health sciences. But, you know, what have we learned from from some of the other industries and sectors? Yeah. So as this picture shows, different industries, always with people. Um, I think it shows to me uh, what I've learned is that it's it's about the journey and the destination, and looking at industries' journeys through the human performance through um, either media or white papers, um, LinkedIn and and so on, and conversations and meeting other human factor professionals that work in different areas. Each industry has had a kind of different. Uh, path, I suppose, that's led them to really focus on human performance, usually driven by something negative. So let's just take the nuclear power industry. And obviously, I'm no expert on uh, any of these, uh, any of this industry. But the um, the accidents that happen, the risk of um, the consequences if something happens, so really drives um, a fierce focus on human factors and human performance in the industry. And I have found that quite a lot of people in biopharma industries have actually come from a nuclear power background, either in power generation um, or something similar. And so they have this mindset 
about really understanding the risk profiles from a human um, inter interaction point of view and how they can reduce um, and mitigate risk at every uh, possible point and also having an understanding of the residual resist risk that remains in the process um, but that the process is resilient enough to come back. When we look at aviation, that's that's been an absolutely fascinating story because that is um, a mixed bag, but it does really show that the prevalence of pilot error, which you will still see in newspaper articles today, um, has meant that it was harder in the past for pilots to actually talk about mistakes or near misses that had happened to them. So the industry got together um, and created different systems for reporting in a very safe space without adverse consequences for pilots, uh, what they have seen and a much more open collaborative way of working. In aviation also, there was the uh, challenge of having the chief pilot and the co-pilot and almost not being able or feeling able to uh, challenge the chief pilot um, in, term, in times of um, um, potential incidents and urgent situations. So they were very open to change and really put the mirror to themselves to think about how to approach it differently. Um, and I also, in, in our training, we say, um, although we've got the fantastic technology in airplanes and so on, the chief pilot will always get out of the plane before they start. They'll go around, they'll kick the tires, they'll look inside the turbine uh, for some very basic major checks, check for ice on the wings and so on. Um, and they do it for a reason. And they have certain standard checklists for in very important things. What they do not have, which sometimes I do see a lot of, they don't have hundreds of checklists for everything. So um, there's a lot to be learned um, from aviation there. And of course, in healthcare, um, they have a program around um, never events, which is really trying to avoid patient harm in the processes and um, understanding the challenges of resource um, demand and supply on the health service and obviously very qualified, dedicated staff um, and finding time to be able to listen up to the weaker signals there of where there are risks for patient. There's um, so much progress has been made in, in healthcare, um, but they have an enormous task ahead of them. As we know, the demand exceeds uh, supply for their uh, business all the time. And finally, in laboratories, where I do have more personal um, experience, um, there's a lot of lone working in laboratories, even though you're working in a team and you're on a lab bench. Um, if you're on your own from the beginning and the end of the test, you might spend quite a lot of time not in any discussion points. So if you're concerned about something or maybe you have some queries, um, having access to people with um, sufficient knowledge, um, people coming around uh, to understand if your work is going OK, if they do need any support. Um, we've learned a lot from laboratories because they have very um, specific methods and very systematic uh, ways of working, um, sometimes um, with limited space. So learning from how the analysts can bring um, their knowledge, their tacit knowledge into the workplace has been a great learning for us as well. Um, sorry, just check my notes here. Um, I would like to talk about very briefly about regulatory direction. Clearly, I'm not an expert on regulatory direction in those other industries. But what I have noticed when I visited um, certain uh, factory sites, not pharmaceutical, particularly high hazard sites, is that some regulators are specifically asking for human factor strategies. They'll ask how you are reducing risk um, human from human error in um, your processes. And that doesn't seem to be quite the focus verbally anyway, or documented from pharmaceutical regulators. So my curiosity is um, how we can learn from other re regulators, such as the health and safety exec um, here in the UK, um, to understand how they could encourage companies to uh, pharmaceutical companies to look at human performance as a strategic endeavor um, in order to improve patient safety and um, compliance with GMP. So when we visit these industries, what do we see? We see discussions with the whole team um, at the beginning of a shift and more importantly, at the end of the shift. So they're really clear on who is doing what during the shift and what did we learn? 
I'll hear people sharing their risks, what risks they're managing today. And people should be feeling more confident that the business is assuring quality in a way that's sustainable. Thanks. No, thank you, Julie. Yeah, no, there's a lot that we can learn from these other sectors, absolutely, uh, and, and build that into, into the healthcare industry. So uh, um, I, I know we, we haven't got a huge amount of time left, but I did want to get through these sure. other couple of questions um, that I had yes. kind of for you. So the next one was yes. around the lines of kind of, are there any other additional benefits to this approach? Hmm. Well, I think I've alluded to some of them um, from this question um, in previous questions, but the, the focus on including everyone that's in the business um, and making sure that we have that diverse a group of people at the, at the virtual table or literally the table to discuss things. Um, we, when we understand how the work is actually done through human performance, we can drive authority down to the point where people are responsible for the action. Sometimes the authority is quite a long way up the organization. Um, we find that KPIs are more streamlined and more meaningful. Um, and we're not just measuring everything because we can. Um, so it's really focusing on some key measures to ensure people can be successful in their day. Um, we also see that people have human performance in their capability build. It's a subject that's taught to them and it's in their development plan. And I th also find that understanding this genuinely collaboratively together really unlocks discretionary effort in a way that you wouldn't have seen before. So if people are genuinely valued, then they'll bring the rest of themselves to work. And I've found we can be quite transformative in the way things happen by using human performance approaches. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's it. Sometimes we can, Nick, we never, we can never underestimate the power of your people. Um, and as you say, if they're, you know, they're, they kind of what they'll bring to the workplace if they're truly motivated and engaged in what they're doing. No, absolutely. Um, and so, um, the final question I, I had for you today, sort of on this discussion topic, is so are there some key steps then that we need to look at to be successful? If you had to sort of summarise what those key steps were when we talk about reframing human error and setting our teams up for success, what, what would they be? Yes. Well, I've used hand image quite a lot today. And um, I do remember at one of the company I worked at, we said quality is in our hands. You know, and I, I truly believe that at any level and any role in the business. Um, I think engaging senior leaders is probably the key way in because um, as they work on the system, they are the ones that help us create the time to learn. So finding um, active sponsors for the human performance, going on gembers with them, helping them understand with the people doing the work, how work is actually done. Quite often um, people are surprised at how difficult we make it to work compliantly and how people just learn to accept difficult work situations almost to the point where they don't notice them. Um, so again, asking open questions is really important. Um, creating awareness for human factors and how it actually benefits. So you uh, communicate, communicate. You can't not communicate. Um, so if we're out on plant, um, it's the type, kind of questions that we ask. It's what we do. So we tend to talk about speak up, listen up, follow up. And we have to have this loop going continually. Otherwise, uh, people just feel that we're just going through the motions of talking. Um, a simple high level roadmap about how you're going to integrate human performance into what you already do into existing systems is a key way in. It's not an additional program. It's just enhancing what you already do. And then thinking about creating cap more capability in your business around human factors. I've heard them called um, human factor champions or advocates. So we can really help people be the go-to um, local SMEs when something happens, rather than immediately going into, oh, it's root cause human error. We can really start to explore what were the factors that influenced people during this situation and take the learning, very important, take the learning from those situations into the organization. Because if, we, if, we, if I've learned, if the group's learned, then the organization needs to learn. No, that's great. No, thanks ever so much, uh, Julie. Um, I can't believe actually how time has just sort of flown by. No, I'm sorry. Oh, I, I, I just rambled no, on too much, great. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I think That's you've given the audience so much um, really valuable information there. 
Um, I think we're going to probably, we're running a bit short now of time for questions, but that's not a problem at all. Please, any questions that you put there in the Q&A panel, we will we will have your details and uh, Julie and I will look at them and we will get back to you so that you will get a response to those questions. Uh, and we'll also send you out some other resources as well. Um, just a couple of things just to mention before we close today is um, Julie will be running for us a, a fantastic course. Um, it's called Human Performance, uh, Looking Beyond That Human Error. Um, so you've got the QR code there on the screen and I think you've got it in the resources within the platform as well. We're running this course on the 30th of June, 1st of July. So it's over two days, four hours each day, instructor led with Julie and then some self-paced learning as well. So it's a virtual delivery, but very much um, with Julie present in the classroom, it's kind of giving you lots of practical tools and techniques that you can take back to the workplace and hopefully implement. So if you're interested uh, in learning more and then please do get signed up to that course and you shall uh, meet Julie again at that. Also, please do follow us on LinkedIn. Um, we are always posting um, new articles and resources, useful information, regulatory updates and so on. Um, so please keep connected with us um, so you see what's going on there. So really, without further kind of ado, and I know we've kind of run out of time now for our 30-minute session, but a big thank you, Julie, for giving up your time and uh, having a chat with me today on this really important topic. Thank you. Um, and um, really um, appreciate that. And, and, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, and uh, we hope to uh, be in touch with you and uh, see you maybe um, on one of our training courses in the future. So thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.